Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Flache. It was a very great introduction. And uh, since we're going to talk about this specific genre of Japanese painting and the devotional text called uh, Karmic Origins, as you can see here, I would like to open my talk with the origin story of my own research and my make relation to the subject of today's topic. As uh, uh, Dr. Flacher has uh, introduced, I uh, back in 2015, uh, already as a master's student, I was I participated in this uh, digitization talk for seven different versions of the so-called karmic origins of the Hachman deity. And it was led by uh, Professor Melanie Trede. And uh, so I was really impressed by the complex narratives of the stories, but also by the constantly urges to reproduce the same story over and over again through history. That the, the interest, uh, such interests and the, such intrigues uh, uh, were very formul uh, formulative for my own research and uh, also helped me to structure today's talk. So I would like to express my thanks again to Dr. Flacher and Across Asia to invite me here and also my thanks uh, to Professor Melanie Trede, who has constantly supported me and also uh, today's conference will be uh, very heavily uh, rely on her thorough research. So uh, thank you to my uh, Dr. Muta. So now let's move on to the artwork. As you can see here in my cover image, like eight uh, banners are descending from heaven onto this very significant pine tree. So this is uh, not, nothing other than the very a manifestation of the deity Hachiman himself, whose name literally means the eight banners. And uh, uh, this miraculous manifestation at this point sends a very clear message to the people who, uh, who've witnessed that, that is to build a shrine to venerate me, uh, renovate me, to, uh, to build a shrine of worship. And indeed, uh, a shrine had Hakozaki was built at this site, and today uh, it is uh, extant in Japan and still claims its uh, origin foundation uh, story through this very moment. Uh, so this is what we would call a karmic origin, uh, Engi. So it, it, it includes the legends, the founding stories, the miracles performed by deities of a certain shrine or temple. And the, the karmic origin of Hachiman uh, usually narrates uh, this mythical invasion led by uh, Empress Jingu of a foreign land uh, he, uh, and her giving birth to her son called Ojin, Emperor Ojin, who is the personal manifestation of this deity along with all the miracles performed by these deities. But as a disclaimer, um, because the text specifies uh, saying this foreign land that Empress Jingu invaded was the kingdom of Xila, which was a historical land on the uh, Korean peninsula. Uh, this uh, usually, uh, is take, was taken or has been still nowadays taken as historical fact uh, in a very nationalistic and sometimes provocative way. Um, which uh, I should assure you, this is uh, nothing more than uh, wishful thinking <laughs> and also uh, should be viewed in uh, a context of a devotional text, a relig re religious karmic uh, text. So, um, so what is very special about uh, this uh, set of two scrolls of the uh, Hachima Ingi at the, in the collection of uh, Stabi is that um, it's the 18th to 19th century copy uh, of an earlier uh, version uh, that was donated to the Kunda Shrine in 1433. So uh, if you uh, if you examine the this uh, reproduced version, you could see first uh, it was not. Uh, 
uh, mounted in a very luxurious way. For example, it has only uh, poorly preserved paper wrappers, which is uh, contrary to the common practice. Usually, you use uh, uh, textiles, even brocade. Um, and also, it is mounted only uh, on a single sheet of paper. So, I would say it's a rather humble materiality. But this humble materiality contrasts to the masterful execution of the the paintings and the the, the, the rendering of the figures uh, in the scrolls. So, this creates kind of an intrigue, like why uh, why this copy was made and why uh, this specific copy was made after this 1433 version. So that will be kind of the major main, main inquiry of today's talk. And just for the convenience, I will call this 14th to 19th century reproduction, the Berlin Scrolls, and in contrary to the original one, which called the Jingu Scrolls, Jingu being the Empress Jingu, who would be the one of the protagonists of the narrative. Uh, so for today's talk, I will uh, divide it into three parts. So first, I will introduce you to the very contents of the narrative of the Hachiman uh, karmic origins and how this story uh, was reproduced several times throughout the history. And then I will examine this specific 1433 version, uh, why it's so significant, why it stands out from the previous versions. And then I will talk about uh, it's afterlife, meaning the many, many attempts to reproduce specifically this very version where uh, the Berlin Scrolls was one of them. Um, and first of all, I would uh, just quickly uh, introduce you to the format of Amaki, as uh, Dr. Flacher uh, mentioned. It has a very complex uh, materiality where uh, uh, a hand scroll is a kind of a common mounting format in for East Asian paintings and calligraphy. It features a, a continuous uh, surface afforded by joining uh, several sheets of paper sideways. Uh, so uh, technically, you could always remount a scroll and add extra uh, sheets of paper to extend the space. And the uh, uh, illuminated hand scrolls, where this uh, narrative form of this mounting format uh, uh, emerged in China and further developed in Japan, it features uh, a narrative uh, rendered in alternating sections of calligraphy or brushed scripts and uh, pictorial depictions. So uh, this long format uh, usually could be used uh, as a, a very creatively as a narrative device. As you can see here in the opening scene of the Berlin Scrolls, um, where, uh, 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 according to the narrative, a foreign nation was invading Japan, and it was led by a demon uh, called Jinlin. And the, the, this, uh, this uh, section uh, is depicted first uh, not with the invasion forces themselves, but with a commotion at the court in the imperial city, where you can see here at the opening of this architecture, uh, a figure is uh, seen only through a uh, part of his garments and uh, bow holding out. This is a rather convention in Japanese painting to uh, portray, uh, to portray uh, imperial or uh, divine presence. So they need to be concealed. Uh, they shouldn't be sh shown uh, in a frontal way, but only indicated, so their presence is only indicated by, uh, uh, for example, very often a drawn curtain, but in this case, just a hint uh, of his action. And what is he doing? He's just he has just let out an arrow shooting at someone but this point we haven't we don't know whom he's sh uh, shooting against and the the long composition gives us a suspense so first we have to go through this long scroll to uh to see uh the 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 warriors and the courtiers hurrying to the site and the uh and also, you should be reminded that to view a hand scrolls, one has to constantly uh, roll up the, the previous part and unroll the, the, the following part to create a viewing space that is no longer usually than just 
uh, like a shoulder length. And in this depiction, that ranges two meters. Um, so the viewers have to go through the middle scenes and wondering what is going on until finally uh, the enemy is revealed. And this is no other than the demon Jinling, who has uh, eight hats and by spill, spitting something magically into the air, uh, materializes his arms in the air and shooting an arrow back. And the, the such tension is emphasized further by the uh, depiction of red thunderbolts in the crooked lines. And in this exchange of attacks, both Jin Lin and the Emperor Chu Ai uh, uh, the, the the archer we we saw before uh, perished, um, and this Emperor Chu Ai uh, was the husband of this Emperor uh, Empress Jinggu, who would later uh, lead uh, a whole army to invade this foreign land to revenge her husband. And the, this episode uh, uh, features the encounter uh, of uh, the Empress with uh, a humble old man who's uh, dressed in a white robe and who would later reveal himself as a local deity Sumiyoshi. Um, this is again a narrative trope in Japanese narrative where uh, certain deities would help the protagonist to achieve certain deeds uh, by disguising themselves as just commoners. And, and again, you can see here Empress Jingu is depicted in a very concealed way, it only indicated by the uh, golden phoenix sitting on her palaquin. And the help uh, Sumi Yushi did provide, including taking out some debacles uh, on the way of uh, the marching army, um, including a huge ox uh, emerging from the sea, which he wrestled away, and also a huge boulder, uh, which he kind of dematerialized uh, using uh, his prowess of archery. And the, more importantly, um, he staged uh, a special dance accompanied by uh, musicians, all dressed in colorful and elaborate costumes to lure up uh, someone from the Dragon Palace to procure uh, a pair of magical items, which would prove very decisive in the following sea battle. And then there are uh, two jewels that are called uh, dry jewel and the wet jewel, which uh, were then thrown thrown into the ocean uh, during this very uh, elaborated long scene of sea battles, where Jingu's uh, army uh, engaged in a battle of fight with uh, with the foreign fleets, and the the, the dry jewel uh, forces the water to recede and exposing the dry land of the seafloor where uh, the uh, the foreign ships were stranded and the, the armies disem disembarked to engage in land battle and then they threw the wet jewel where the waves uh, come back and drown the enemy to victory. Uh, so that this is the opening of the second scroll of this set. It features this very controversial scene of the subjugation of the enemy country. Again, this is uh, should not be taken as a historical fact. It is a uh, very romanticized and fictionalized, fictionalized uh, scene of uh, a battle where um, uh, the uh, in the text, the three kings of Sheila, uh, obviously referencing to the three kingdoms uh, on the Korean peninsula, uh, prostrated with their attendants and soldiers to Empress Jingu. This is the first and only time when Jingu is shown uh, in her full presence, and she's uh, she has donned uh, a whole set of armor of a warrior and is brushing or like inscribing a line uh, declaring victory on the rock with the uh, tip of her bow. And this, and this line reads, and I beg your pardon, uh, the, the kings of Sila are the dogs of Japan. This is very humiliating and very provocative and uh, would be in the later ages be used uh, as kind of a 
proof to show the superiority of Japanese race in a very nationalistic uh, setting. But at this time, I would encourage encourage you to look at uh, this moment also in the specific depictions of the foreign uh, foreign land, including uh, the very Chinese looking of garments that uh, supposedly Korean kings are wearing, as well as the architectural depictions, which features the stone staircase, stone tiles, and uh, stone tiled floors and the roofs. Um, and as well as the folded, uh, the canvases of the galleries and the very rough, uh, facial features of the warriors. Um, so, uh, they may, they may have been, uh, they may have uh, been based on some real life, uh, models, but they are far from a representation of the historical reality. In fact, there are a specific visual tropes to depict anything foreign, including China, Korea, and also India, because it's just too far away. So it must look uh, continental, but also fantastic settings like the residences of the King of Hell or the the Dragon Palaces. Um, in other uh, words, they are just uh, imagination or representations of the other. Um, so again, this is a kind of a, a very romanticized depictions. And after this decisive battle, uh, and before the um, Empress Jingu already realized when she went into war, she, she was already pregnant with her late husband's child, which she uh, then gave birth to, uh, uh, who turned out to be the Emperor Ojin, and later the manifestation, the personal, the, the, the human manifestation of the deity Hachiman. And uh, uh, again, here uh, you can see the compositions are decisively long, where uh, very curiously there's uh, a shift of pers perspective that zooms out from the birth of Ojin to a faraway uh, depiction. Um, uh, uh, so, to, uh, we, where I just borrow the cinematic language, so this zooming out uh, not only serves as a narrative device to uh, sweep, uh, to shift the perspective from one scene to another, but also helped with this. which would later be, uh, become the Usa Hachiman Shrine. And while they were constructing this shrine, they saw yet another miracle happening, uh, which is uh, the, the iconic moment that I introduced you at the beginning of the talk. And this become another Hachiman Shrine. So followed by some further uh, uh, oracles and the miracles, uh, the, the whole set of scrolls concludes uh, with this final scene that over, overviews uh, the precincts of two major shrines of Hachiman worshipping, which is which are the Usa Hachiman Shrine and the Iwashi Mizu Hachiman Shrine, and their significance I will come back later in my talk. So the at the very end of uh, this scroll, there is a colophon, and this colophon is a colophon at the end of scroll usually. Uh, kind of narrates or talks about the origin story of the, the scrolls themselves, why they were produced, who were the donors, who were the uh, people who donated the money. Um, and But this colophon is not for the Berlin scrolls. They, they, it was uh, copied with fidelity from its original set from the 1433. And the, uh, um, Oh, some sorry, something was missed. So the uh, the colophon states: so the karmic origin of Empress Jingu are painted anew and are dedicated to the Kongda Cumulus, the Kongda Shrine. So and it was donated 
and uh, initiated by someone called Ashikaga Yoshinori, which I will re return later. Um, but before I come to further uh, scrutiny of this uh, 40, 1433 versions, uh, I just uh, briefly recap a little bit about uh, the Hachiman uh, uh, beliefs or the cult of Hachiman. It was probably started uh, in the northern Kyushu Island, which is the very uh, uh, west, most western island of Japan. And uh, uh, some scholars uh, speculate uh, uh, from the older reading of Hachiman Yahapa, uh, which could be a pun for the eight fields. Uh, it, uh, they speculated it was probably just a very small local belief uh, that wasn't that of significance uh, from the seventh, seventh century. And, but in the 8th century, during the Nala period, a uh, 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 certain emperor who moved his capital to Nara uh, to, in order to build up a new uh, political and power network of his own. And he built a very famous Nara Great Buddha in 749. Um, and uh, on the occasion of completing this uh, huge, uh, gigantic statue of Buddha, they also invited uh, the deity Hachiman from Kyushu Island, which uh, was uh, the, the the cult was probably centered around the uh, nowadays Usa Hachiman shrine uh, to more central Japan. And uh, uh, gradually, more more shrines were built into the in the central Japan. And in the 11th century. Uh, Hachiman deity, considered to be a patron of uh, martial arts, was taken as the ancestral deity of the warrior clan Minamoto. Um, and uh, also in later in the during the Mongol invasion, uh, there are two invasions uh, in uh, twelve seventy four and twelve. 81, uh, somehow the Mongolian fleets were miraculously just wiped out by certain storms, which were believed to be uh, the kamikaze, the divine winds. And this also miraculous uh, defeat of the Mon Mongol armies were also attributed to the Hachiman shrine, uh, to the Hachiman deity uh, before the in, uh, invasion, even a court. Uh, 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 contemporary uh, uh, court, uh, sorry, um, uh, statement uh, remarked in his diary said this uh, invasion was so major it takes probably all the three deities of the Amaterasu, uh, the Tsang deity, uh, the Kasuga, the deity, the ancestral deity of the uh, the most powerful aristocratic clan and Hachiman together to defeat this invasion by calling to all the three ancest ancestral uh, deities. Basically, he's also saying uh, he takes all the uh, elites and uh, warriors and aristocrats of this country uh, to fend off the invasion. Um, so also after the Mongolian uh, Invasion, Mongol invasions of the late 13th century, um, more and more Hachiman shrines were established across the country. And whenever a new shrine was built, um, uh, there, there comes there came the need for the new reproduction of a, a Hachiman engi, where a, like a set of Hachiman scrolls to be uh, revered at the new shrine. Um, but uh, in the early versions, usually the depictions, the, sorry, the renderings of the iconographies are rather simple. So they are usually they just take uh, the very decisive moment in the karmic text and they're rendered in a very minimal way, um, where certain again certain narrative tropes were used, where you just. Uh, portray just one or a pair of uh, attendants or warriors and to indicate uh, they are in multi multiplicity. Uh, so kind of you need to read the narrative by invoking your own imagination. And uh, sometimes uh, the depictions are just uh, simply uh, arranged in a, 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 in a well, simple composition uh, without any complexities or the the spatial context to to it um but uh there still remains this 
uh, tension that described by Melanie Trader as uh, the urges to singularize or to secretize uh, an object, to make an object an object one of its kind, to make make an object sacred and special, and also the urges to standardize to to rather. Uh, um, mass produce. So we also see uh, certain versions where although the depictions are still simple and uh, straightforward, uh, more thoughts are put into that to make it uh, rather special. For example, in this case, the excessive, excessive use of the gold pigments, uh, trying to make it look uh, less simplistic and more luxurious. But all in all, uh, the the transmissions of the uh, the iconographies remain rather uh, stable. Um, but uh, note until fourteen thirty three, uh, there is a man when he commissioned uh, a new version of the Hachiman scrolls. He wasn't satisfied with the simple depictions of. Uh, of the iconography, he's aiming for something more grand. He's aiming for something uh, more showy, and he. Uh, so that is the four, fourteen thirty three. Sorry, fourteen thirty three uh, version of Hachiman scrolls, which was weirdly named uh, the the karmic origins of the Empress Jingu. So, um, what was uh, just simple and uh, straightforward was uh, triply or and then you can see here at the opening scene, which uh, usually only features. Uh, a simple procession of uh, Empress Jingu's palaquin was expanded into this seven meter long uh, composition, which starts with the very peaceful moments uh, in the in the space of the imperial court, and you can see people are just conducting regular activities, and the acti and the commotions were gradually added uh, as as the as the narrative proceeds, which uh, can also be read as a passage of a longer uh, period of times. So as if the age has come from a peaceful one to to that of terminals, and that's when. Uh, the moment that we saw earlier uh, happened where the Emperor Chuai started to defend against someone. Uh, just a quick remark, you can see how heavily the pigments are applied here compared to what we saw before. And uh, another feature is that in uh, in the earlier uh, renderings of the Hachman narrative, uh, a lot of attention or more attention uh, was given to the text which remains sacred and also important in the practice of reproducing uh, uh, the karmic origins. And the illustrations, uh, oh, sorry, the paintings were more like illustrations to the text, where, um, uh, where you just re read through the text and finally get a simple visualization of what you just read, or because of the proximity, uh, you could quickly glance to the illustration as if it, it was just a reference and come back to the text. But um, in the uh, with very long compositions, I would argue uh, the elongated painting would push further the text away and so draw your more attention to the paintings themselves. And also the composition or the narrative devices were very creatively used to uh, reinforce that. As you can see here in this uh, scene where uh, this uh, miracle happened, um, a gold uh, ray uh, kind of shot into the imperial palace and seen by the son of Ojin, and then he just sent an envoy to investigate. As you can see here, the uh, the the envoy. Uh, along with his entourage is coming, venturing into the mountains 
and uh, going through uh, some uh, mountain mist, uh, he reappeared at the top of the mountain. This is uh, a typical narrative device called Iji Dozu, literally meaning different times depicted in the same picture. Um, it is a device, uh, well, in the uh, European tradition, you would call it a syn synoptic narrative, where in just one portrayal, you'll see several actions happening at the same time. And here, uh, the composition is uh, even reinforced uh, by this uh, careful arrangement of the entourage into a kind of a curve going up that that are lead that is leading your attention or your gaze further into the painting and uh, what you see here as the clouds is called a suyali uh, gasumi is the the lens shaped clouds that is usually used in japanese hand scrolls as a kind of a framing device but here it also not only adding to the atmosphere of the mountains but uh, it's also used to collapse the distance to suggest a passage of time again, and also uh, the the long distance the envoy has traveled. And this uh, careful composition that trying to draw you into the painting uh, invite you to uh, conduct a more immersive viewing uh, was uh, uh, taught by uh, Melanie Trede uh, as a as aesthetic turn uh, in the development of producing Hutchman scrolls, where the paintings kind of transformed from, from merely illustrations uh, to independent pictorial narratives themselves. Um, and also uh, there is a shift from the uh, from the urge to secretize to the, the devotional purpose uh, I shouldn't say it's a, sh a shift. So the, the focus on the devotional aspect is kind of supplemented by a, a strong urge uh, after the aesthetic renderings, the aesthetic artistic appreciations. And further into like uh, this section, um, as you can see here, uh, like among this scene of constructing the Usa Hachiman Shrine, a uh, child is depicted uh, kind of uh, surprised by something, exclaiming at something that certainly or supposedly has sent her in awe. And uh, again, uh, the same technique uh, happens where, sorry, um, um, we're given a pause to create uh, a visual suspense where we, our gaze goes through this empty space over the seascape uh, before our gaze lands onto this uh, iconic moment of the descending eight banners. And so for uh, uh, anyone who's familiar with the narrative, this would only released. And secondly, uh, before the suspense, you already know what you are expecting. It will be the eight banners, but uh, then you are surprised because the eight banners are depicted in a, in a composition you never seen again, it, which is uh, which was painted anew. So uh, clearly, uh, so this uh, person or this donor who commissioned uh, the hand scrolls were aiming for something very grandiose, and he's no other than the sixth shogun of the Yoshik Yoshikaga. Uh, government or Yoshikaga family called Yoshinori. Um, he's a very particular character. Uh, he's very famous for his uh, random tempers and being very par particular about the details and which uh, kind of really annoyed and even terrified a lot of, of his contemporaries uh, to the extent that he was recorded in one of the diarists at the time that once uh, one of his uh, female companion badmouthed about a folding screen they were looking at and he got so angry he he reached out to his sword and rattled it and then exiled this woman uh, out of his household so uh, 
But uh, for art historian, we are delighted to know he's also a fan for art. So he's very uh, active in the production and also uh, sponsoring the productions of artworks. So th this 1433, uh, 1433 project was one of the most uh, grand uh, project of uh, not only Hachman uh, uh, worshipping, but also uh, as a project of political legit legitimation. So what he produced was not only uh, the Jingu scrolls or the this new version of Hachiman scrolls, but a completely set of freak scrolls called the Karmic Origins of the Kunda Tumulus. It was based on an old uh, version, old set of scrolls he saw before, uh, and it narrates only the 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 passing away of the emperor Ojin would later be they who would later uh, be revealed to be Hachiman deity and the the scroll features a lot of visits to the uh, Kunda tumulus or the Kunda shrine uh, by some early legendary emperors but also by religious figures like a monk uh, Yoki or uh, a courtier, uh, courtier called uh, Sugawara no Michizane who uh, was uh, the the subject of my own research, but uh, who was later also deified as the thunder deity, and uh, also there are visits by all kinds of emperors uh, all the way to rather uh, uh, near ages. So this is this uh, basically a way to legitimize oneself as kind of the heir of all the uh, long lineage of uh, powerful and religious figures. And this was further sealed by a uh, colophon explaining how the Minamoto clan, which Asikaga Yoshinori belongs to, was uh, a descendant of no other than the Seiwa, uh, as a Seiwa emperor, so from the imperial uh, lineage. So, if uh, so, basically, uh, he's trying to write uh, his own, his the the, own, the the very history of his own family into this long lineage. And another European uh, example I could think of, which was almost uh, contemporary to Yoshinori, was the Maximilian uh, uh, from uh, from Habsburg, uh, the Holy Roman Empire. Emperor, uh, the portrait of his uh, grandson just happened to be sitting outside this lecture hall, which he also commissioned huge projects to kind of create narratives to write himself, write the history of Habsburg into uh, dynasties of uh, Holy Roman emperors. So, and uh, this is not over. So, the, not only so these two sets of scrolls were. Uh, donated to Konda Hachman shrines. If you remember at the end, uh, the very end of the, the Jingu scrolls, uh, there are very two important Hachman shrines depicted, depicted the Wusa Hachman, the Iwashimizu Hachman. So the Jingu scrolls was, was produced not only just one set, but a set of three. And uh, two more uh, sets were sent and uh, donated to Usa and Iwashimizu Hachiman shrines. So basically by this project, he's tying together a network of Hachiman worshiping from all over Japan into a network of his own, um, which is not only a, a devotional act, a political act, but also an, an ambitious um, a project for artistic uh, appreciation. So uh, his purpose or his aim was very clear. He's going to pr produce a decisive version of the Hachiman scrolls that can never be topped. That will be the best uh, of all ages. And uh, and indeed, uh, it wasn't surpassed for a while. <laughs> uh, of course, later artists were very creative, but uh, his wishes his wishes were sort of also granted as people were really appreciating this 1433, 1433 uh, version of Hachiman scrolls. Um, already in the 16th century, two versions were produced to be donated to 1641, uh, a certain calligrapher called Ohashi Ryukei, who was serving at the shogunate of a different samurai family, the Tokugawa shogunate, um, for some reason that I'm not uh, uh, that 
it is not to my knowledge he commissioned uh, uh, a set he commissioned the reproduction of the Jingu scrolls as a facsimile as a close copy and donated to the same Kunda shrines uh, Kunda Hachiman shrine uh, so people speculated that the viewing of the original version, the 1433 version, was so often uh, people started to worry about the uh, preservation of the scrolls. So they produced just an, a copy for people to view so the, the original Jingu scrolls could be kept in safety. And as well, so the, the scrolls were viewed several times and the mentions uh, were included in a lot of travel logs were uh, uh, travel guidebooks where people remarks like at, at the Kongda shrine, one of the must see is this set of Jingu scrolls. And, uh, uh, and later, uh, what Berlin scrolls, the, the Berlin set uh, belongs to, um, as we have spec speculated, was probably um, purely an artistic practice. So it was not uncommon at the time where people copy uh, uh, the works of old masters as a way to memorize the canon, as a way to also develop one's own uh, artistic uh, uh, earth. Um, but uh, what are the exact reasons we don't know? But uh, uh, no doubt the producers uh, were the two painters of the Berlin scrolls were very, very pain, were devoting themselves into this reproduction project. Um, although uh, this set, the Berlin scrolls, are not completely uh, colored, but you can see in the lower right image the application of the pigments were done with such subtlety that uh, uh, this kind of rendering with gradation to convey a sense of volumes were practiced throughout the the, the production of the whole scrolls. And also uh, the line rendering of the figures and of the details of the decorations were given much care. Uh, there was, uh, although you could say uh, in terms of the uh, coloration, uh, there are moments where the painters just gave up and uh, kind of, you know, the idea moment, uh, but uh, uh, given into the work um, and also for important moments, especially those le like laden with uh, religious or devotional values uh, were not taken lightly. So as you can see here, this descending of the eight minors uh, banners uh, moment uh, is colored and executed with full uh, pigments and full uh, uh, efforts. So, uh, of course, uh, the story doesn't uh, stop here. I, well, into the modern time, uh, Hachiman scrolls were reproduced as art historical objects. Uh, they were taken as uh, in the most nationalistic moments as uh, historical evidence of Japan's conquering of Korea. Uh, and also it was taken by art historian in uh, early 20th century as exemplars of Japanese painting to formulate a nationalistic, again, uh, narrative of Japanese art. And uh, nowadays, they are also digitized, as I mentioned before, uh, in many uh, uh, digitized, in two digitization projects, uh, one was uh, one is the project I mentioned before, the Hachiman Digital Hand Scroll Project at the Heidelberg University, um, where uh, uh, the the approach was rather didactic or very uh, focusing on bring out the details and the interpretations of the Hachiman scrolls and the. The, the calligraphies and the, the motifs are uh, all annotated with text and the, each version was introduced with a well-researched well uh, introductory text. And also there's the uh, light table function for the viewers to compare uh, the renderings from different uh, versions. And uh, of course, uh, go, coming back <laughs> to Cross Asia, uh, where we are now, uh, the, 
the Stabi also launched uh, its own like digitization project. I think earlier this year. Um, it's Japanese hand scroll projects of the cross Asia, where the uh, paintings were the hand scrolls are digitized in very high quality images and featuring a very smooth viewing window without uh, because the Hachiman project at the Heidelberg University was uh, criticized several times for being too intrusive and wrapping the scrolls into too many layers of narratives where the uh, cross Asia digitization project can itself. Uh, so uh, um, just maybe to wrap up my talk. Um, so I introduce you to this uh, very complex, very controversial narrative of the Hachiman Engi, but I also talk about uh, another narrative of how these Engis, how these karmic origins were reproduced in different situations by different groups of people uh, from different communities and with laden with very uh, no less uh, social and political motivations. And then I uh, secretly slipped into an uh, art historical narrative where uh, the 1433 version became a turning point of the development of Hachiman scrolls. And in the end, I think I would like to in encourage you to come out of all these narratives and uh, uh, go back to the artwork. Um, in the European tradition, sometimes a copy or reproduction uh, is usually kind of uh, overlooked or not given much a serious thought, but just by uh, going into th and the details and just browse through uh, the wonderful execution of the Berlin Scrolls, you will find uh, uh, the much surpri surprises, but also you could almost feel the awe that the, the painters of the Berlin Scrolls felt when they, they appreciated the 1433 scrolls. Uh, they felt so touched that they all uh, they felt compelled to devote their energies and times in the reproduction of this 18th to 19th century set of Hachiman scrolls, which is at the Stabi collection. So that is my talk. Thank you very much.